thank you, Ellie. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, so my name's Paul Walton. I'm from chemistry. I'm going to talk about biofuels, um, which is um, not wholly a new venture for me, but uh, partly a new venture for me. We do work in biofuel research, as Ellie said, um, but for today's meeting, I broadened that and folded in uh, what I know about biofuel context. Uh, so I plan the talk to be a wider appeal than just science, although I will, I will mention some of the science that we do, we do in the department. Now, I plan the talk as in, in the following way, and just, just to kind of keep your attention, as there, I should tell you, there are 30 slides in total, and the slides are numbered at the top, so you know kind of where I am and when it comes to slides. And you can fall asleep at particular bits, but if you identify, identify where you're interested in this list here, I've numbered the slides where that will come up. So I'm going to start with the global energy context, that's just one slide and then one later. I'm going to answer this question, which is really quite important one, are biofuels really necessary? Um, and I'd like to exercise that a little bit. What are biofuels? That requires a definition. And then I'd like to talk about um, what I'm beginning to learn uh, about biofuels and, and environmental sustainability, is that there are many factors in deciding whether they should be used or not. I'd like to, I've, I've entitled that Not All Biofuels Are Equal, and talk about environmental sustainability. You notice there's quite a few slides there. The next bit is something what I call is, so what's the big problem? So I'll, I'll address it, I'll say that biofuels are great, blah, 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 and we should use them in this particular context. Uh, but I'll, and then I'll mention what the problem is. Uh, come in, folks. Um, right. um, then I'd like to talk about something called the enzyme cost barrier and talk a little bit about economics. And if we have anyone here from economics, we're very interested in your thoughts on this. And then I'd like to talk about some of the work we've done in chemistry. I call it a solution from science rather grandly. Uh, you'll decide for yourself whether we provided something of a solution or not. And then at the end, I'd just like to open up something for a challenge. And you'll notice in my analysis, uh, a serious challenge does appear, which is a global challenge, and one that has all sorts of elements of sustainability in there, not least of which is social sustainability. And I'd be really interested in your comments on that. Okay, um, I, heard, um, I heard the following phrase, which alarmed me several years ago. Um, by an American academic, and he said the following. He said, if the world built a nuclear re reactor every single week, so you know, one week would go by, we'd get one nuclear reactor, two weeks go by, we'd have another nuclear reactor. Every single week between now and the 2050, so 33 years in hence, uh, we would not have enough power to meet our world energy demands. Uh, such is the scale of the increase in world energy demands that we, humankind, face and you can cut down that question in all sorts of different ways. This is a plot of the, in blue, the current energy usage of particular areas of the world. And you notice that, for instance, China is a very heavy energy user. Uh, in fact, the, the, the largest in this group of people, in group of countries. The United States uses a lot. Japan uses relatively little. Uh, Brazil, a uh, large country, but uses very little. Relatively little. And on the top of that, the red ones are the increases in those countries' energy demands between now and 2040, not 2000, 2050. And you notice, by the way, all my references are all be, all be at the bottom. And just from this plot here, you can see that the demand in energy use by the world, just to keep us going in particular at the, at the same rate, partly because of population explosion, increases by about, about a third. It's very significant. If you break that down in different ways, um, how do we expect to meet those energy demands? Well, at the bottom here is time, and, the, and up here is a quadrillion British thermal units. Don't, don't worry about the units, just that's a unit, unit, unit of energy. And 2010 is rough, roughly where we are around here. And at the moment, about a third of the total power across, uh, energy across the world comes from oil, then about a quarter from, from coal, and then, then a mixture of gas, renewables, and nuclear. Um, the one I want you to concentrate on, though, is the light blue one there, so-called renewables. And you'll notice that uh, to meet this increase in energy demand from, from here to here, 2040, and 2040, by the way, will be in many of our lifetimes, in hopefully most of our lifetimes, so this increase is going to happen whilst we're alive. you notice that um, the renewables go from about 10.5% of total energy usage at 500 quadrillion British thermal units to something like 15% of, of a, a much higher number. In other words, renewables as an energy source, and we'll talk about those in a second, have to something like triple in their contribution to world energy demands. 
So focus comes, it's a, it's a global challenge, and we all know this. And focus comes on how we, as uh, a planet, are able to meet this particular uh, energy, energy demand through, through renewables. So, can we answer that question? Well, here, this is, this is renewable energy use. So this is the amount of power that we actually generate and use. And this is renewable, so this is things that we would say are things which, which don't have an environmental impact. Uh, broken down by their sources. And you notice that from 2008 to 2016 well, now, uh, hydropower, which is the top one, is, makes a big contribution to sustainable energy uh, sources. That's dams and uh, with, with, with hydropower, power them, hydropower on them. And that is increasing. That is increasing at a rate that we'd like to increase. We have a very significant contribution, and we all know this. When you know, when we drive down the A1, you'll see those wind turbines going up. Pretty much anywhere now, you'll see wind turbines going up in this country and worldwide too. Is the contribution to energy from wind? This is the brown one here. Is increased very significantly over that time too. And um, as a source of power, it is making a big, con is making a big contribution. Solar uh, photovoltaic capacity. And by the way, this is gigawatts of electricity here, GWE. Uh, solar photovoltaic capacity, which is connected to the grid, is also now making a big contribution. And you see a little bit of contribution. Oh, that, sorry, that was that on the end there, isn't it? And then we've got solar heating capacity. This is gigawatts thermal here, uh, also making a, a big contribution. So our electricity and our thermal needs are being partly met uh, by those particular technologies. And you say, well, that's all good, Paul. Why, why, why are we all standing, sitting here, talking about power and energy? Well, the interesting bit about this plot, and the one that should throw a question mark, are for these two plots, it applies down here. The grey one, and if you can see this one, this is ethanol production. We're going to talk quite a bit about ethanol production. Ethanol is a liquid fuel. So um, if we, go, we can go across to the chemistry department and we can get a bottle of ethanol, we can pour it out here, and we can set fire to it. It's got some calorific content. And in fact, if you're clever, you can run your car on ethanol, it needs to be ad adapted, and you can run machines on ethanol. It, it's, a, it's a good fuel source. And then we have biodiesel down here. Biodiesel is a, a different product uh, from plants. Uh, and biodiesel, you see, is hugged at the bottom here and makes a small contribution, uh, but not a great one. And moreover, this is somewhat complicated by the current worries about diesel, diesel cars and diesel engines and the like to make a contribution to environmental sustainability. The key thing about those is compared to the other renewable technologies, their contribution is relatively flat. And you have to ask the question, why? Why are these particular fuels not advancing the pace that the other te renewable technologies seem to be doing? And why aren't they making potentially their, their contribution to global energy needs? And there's another question as well that comes with this. Why is that so important? That's so important because liquid fuel that's the fuel that you would put in your car, or British Airways would put in their plane, or someone would use to run any kind of uh, significant machine, uh, are the things that are needed for high energy, demand, uh, high energy demand uses. For instance, flying. If you want to fly a plane, then you need liquid fuel. You can't, we can't fly a plane, a commercial plane, on solar power. We can't, we, nobody's invented a nuclear-powered plane. Um, nobody's invented a nuclear-powered car. Um, so m many of the modes of transport and many of the kind of demands of liquid fuel are critical for uh, the way of life. And this has opened up a gap. This has opened a gap in uh, the ability of us not only to meet our energy demands, but in our, our ability to meet our fuel demands. And the, that question mark is one that kind of frames what I'm, what I'm talking about. So what are biofuels? Now, biofuels, you, you see, um, kind of described in all sorts of different ways. I use the following definition. A biofuel is something you grow, and you can see the stuff outside there, that you use, usually at source, to generate power. So you could burn it, right? And that would be a biofuel. Uh, what you're not allowed to do, by the way, is a biofuel I would not count as uh, oil or coal or gas, because that's plants that were buried in the past, and now you're using them. So biofuel is something that's great, that's growing now. Now, of course, that's a, that's a broad definition, and you would say up, in, up until the Industrial Revolution, by the way, that we, we all pretty much use biofuel, we'd all burn wood or something like that. With the advent of using fossil fuels, then that, that argument changed, and we used uh, energy sources from the past, 
right? And those, those are not biofuels. Biofuels have come back into the argument because of the following. If you take energy from a plant, let's say that's out there, that plant has gained ultimately its energy from the sun. And if you gain your energy ultimately from the sun and use it, that is sustainable. It's sustainable both energetically, it's also sustainable in terms of what's called the carbon cycle, in terms of using CO2. So biofuels, if we're able to harness them and we're able to use them, are things that we grow and we use, let's say, immediately um, and efficiently. And those can be sustainable environmentally and, and you'll, you'll see in a second economically. Um, now, if you look at the look at the uh, kind of slide here, there are different types of biofuels. This, this I don't know if you recognise this plant. This is a corn starch plant. Um, in fact, some of you may be able to. You can grow this in Eng England. It's a bit difficult, but it's grown in kind of uh, uh, much warmer countries. Corn starch as a fuel source is very important. In fact, you may have heard of corn ethanol. What happens is these plants are grown in on arable land, uh, and they take the farmers take the the, the, the corn starch that comes out of there and it's processed and fermented through to ethanol. It's the same as you would ferment for your wine or your beer, uh, except that you distill it afterwards to get, get all this pure ethanol. And that's all fine. But think about it for a second. Um, if you're growing a corn starch plant, and they're about, they're about yay high, they're about the taller than me, most things are taller than me, about six foot. About six foot. Um, you, the, the bit of the plant you use is only the bit at the top here. And in fact, it's about 5% of the total plant mass is, is used then for conversion into fuel. And so the rest of it is, is essentially lost. This thing here is something called energy crop or energy, energy uh, grass. And if you, if you take a trip up to, uh, now was it Farlington, if that's just between here and Easingwold, there's a farm in a, a, a rather... Um, innovative farmer there who's started to grow energy cane, um, this, this type of grass, for, for energy use. And they're, they're actually fields of it. And this is very interesting, and I'll talk about this on the next slide. Energy, uh, this, this type of fuel here, uh, this type of grass here, um, can be grown at very high density. Um, it can be grown on scrub land. Uh, it can be grown with very little kind of need for fertilization and water uh, and tending. And so in many respects, it's, it's, a, it's an ideal plant. The trouble is, the trouble is that all of it is made out of bits of plant that we cannot convert into fuel. And I, brought, I, I stole this from Estates, which is uh, from just outside there. I'm, I'm going to pass this round. This is this is a this is a very similar type of plant to the one that uh, that's, uh, that's that I got on the slide there. And all I need to do is kind of feel it, and you'll notice it's pretty hard. Uh, and you'll you'll just know instinctively that 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 type of plant is is almost impossible to ferment through to fuel. That's despite the fact, by the way, that it contains essentially sugars in there, albeit in complex form. So biofuels, uh, there are biofuels that we can use, which we can convert sustainably through to, to liquid fuel. And there are other types of biofuels where the energy content, no, I don't need that. The energy, the energy content is there, uh, the energy content is there, but we're unable at the moment to ferment that through. But one more thing to tell you. If, you were, if we were to take all of the available biomass the world produce every year, then the total energy content of that is 20 times the global annual oil usage. It's, it's absolutely enormous, is the amount of biomass in terms of its calorific, type, calorific value. So here's the thing. Not all biofuels are, are created equal. So I talked about cornstarch and I talked about grasses. Here's an example. This is, um, this is greenhouse gas reduction of particular types of fuels. So here's gasoline, right, gas that we drive, the uh, petrol that we put in the car, and that's the base one. If you were to take this cornstarch plant that I showed you in the previous slide, and we call that, and gen generate ethanol out of it, then we find that you get something like a 20% reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions for the use of that fuel, that fuel, right? That's fine. If we were able to take that plant there, and we're able to, so that's the right hand fuel that was on the previous slide, and we're able to ferment it, uh, and that's called cellulosic ethanol, we can come back to that a lot more later, you see that we get an enormous reduction in greenhouse gases. Fantastic, right? Really worth going. But take a look at the right hand column. The right hand column, and this shows you the complexity of what people in this field call life cycle analysis and total analysis. 
is if you include what is land usage cost, so that's the cost of taking a field that was growing something else, let's call it cabbages, and put in this particular plant on, corn or grasses, what then is the greenhouse gas reduction over gasoline? Over gasoline. And you find that corn ethanol is worse, is worse than burning petrol in your car. Uh, in fact, it's significantly worse, it's almost double. Um, and that um, cellulosic ethanol is, is slightly better, but still, still, still bad. And it reveals this point, that when it comes to considering biofuels, and this, this is the, kind of the key question I want to pose in front of you. When it comes to considering biofuels, multiple factors have to be included in the consideration of whether those biofuels are environmentally or economically sustainable. And this, even this small analysis here shows that that's not straightforward. So for instance, food prices. If, if, the, if we decide that fuel is the most important thing for us, we would then encourage farmers to grow cornstarch on their fields. That's fine, right? But of course, as soon as a field is taken up with growing cornstarch, then it can no longer generate food. The consequence of that is food prices go up. What about water use associated with these plants? How sustainable is that? What about uh, the location of the fuel? Can we locate the, uh, these fuel crops in places where there's lots of, lots of biomass, or do we have to locate them elsewhere? And rather oddly, if you take corn ethanol and you want to make bioethanol out of it, it actually takes energy to make it. You have to burn fuel to make the fuel. Um, and so all these questions come, in, come into play about whether we should actually use these types of fuels. Do they give us the benefit that we expect them to give? So let me introduce you to Miscanthus giganteus. I think that's the word, um, which is uh, uh, another name for this energy crop that is grown out in Farlington, but also, as it turns out, around the world. Why is this, why is this an important crop? Well, it's a grass, it's a perennial, um, and it's, uh, you can grow it in, in very dense kind of uh, agriculture. About, it yields about 27 tonnes per acre. Remarkably, it needs no specific irrigation. Um, it is drought and salt, salt resistance. It needs no fertiliser. And importantly, and this is a consideration which often escapes those debates, it leaves the soil structure intact. In fact, there's an interesting debate about. There's an interesting debate in the middle of, uh, in the Midwest the rest of the moment is the the growth of wheat there, um, which is a constant kind of production course. Each time you grow wheat, you lose some of the soil, and the best estimates at the moment, after about 50 years, under the current wheat production, the U.S. will have lost all of its soil in the Midwest, and they exaggerate not a lot, if if at all is that the consequences of that, of course, are, absolute, uh, are, are, are catastrophic. And so considerations of things like this become important. So when it comes to biofuels, we have to, we have to throw these factors into, account, in, in, into the account. Here's another example. This is the, the loss of soil with various potential sources of biofuel. So cornstarch here, which is the fuel, is the, is the plant used to generate bioethanol at the moment, and I'll show you some areas in the world where that's done. And each time you grow that, you lose about 20 tonnes per hectare per year, year of soil every time you grow that crop. And of course, the, and that's just carbon loss. And that, 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 is a, that, that is limited. Soya beans, another source of fuel, is an enormous soil loss. Short rotation wood, um, which uh, I didn't know until I looked it up, is uh, where you move, you rotate on fields and you grow wood. What's the soil loss there? Well, it's better, but it's about uh, four tons per year. Perennial herbaceous, which are the grasses, and that's the thing that's going around there, um, they retain the soil largely because they don't take up carbon from the soil. That all the all the carbon, all the carbon that's in the plant is taken up CO two from the uh, from the air. So these perennial herbaceous plants, as fuel sources, are beneficial because, for all sorts of reasons, not because of their lack of water use or fertiliser use, but because also they reduce significantly the loss of soil. In fact, I've listed here the, the, the benefits of using these so-called perennials as potential fuel, use, fuel sources. 
low input costs, so it needs very little cultivation, uh, needs no seed, needs no fertilizer, needs very little labor. And by the way, I'm going to pause at this point and ask you to extend your thoughts as an international development network about then how these, it makes the farming and availability of these crops extensive. Um, the, fuel, the maximum fuel you bear per acre is high. Uh, something called out of phase harvesting, the grasses are ready for harvesting at the times when other crops are not ready for harvesting. In other words, your farmers aren't harvesting absolutely everything at the same time, so they could grow the grasses and harvest them in winter uh, and then harvest normally in the, in the summer. Low nitrogen emissions, minimum soil erosion I mentioned. Uh, minimal competition with food, why? Because you can grow these grasses on, on scrubland and wasteland and abandoned land. And it goes back to this thing I raised earlier about competition for food production and arable land as the grasses don't. I want to use efficiency, salt, salt and drought tolerance, and they can be adapted to marginal land. And I'm going to come back to that right at the very last slide about how these potential, notice I use the word potential fuel crops, can be grown on marginal land. And marginal land is usually owned by the poorest in our society. If there's subsistence farmers, they will own marginal and scrub land. So you can talk up, all that up and, and ask the question, where then is the land that we do not use, that's we as farmers, where we don't grow anything, where is it? Um, and this study's been done, and we, I called it here degraded or abandoned land, that is available for, I, I call them cellulosic crops, but you can imagine these as, as grasses. And take a look. Uh, you can, your geography will be good enough to tell you where these places are. So Africa, of course, here's the Sahara Desert. Nothing grows there. there are, and red is good, and blue is bad, by the way. Uh, you get good areas through the Central Africa and down into, down into mid-South mid Africa, and then very little down, down here, but not so bad. Brazil is good, but the west, side of, the west side of South America is not so great. India, India, and I'm going to show you, and the next slide I'm going to repeat, the next slide I'm going to show you is the repeat of the earlier slide of where the growth areas are in terms of energy. India, which is one of the areas where we expect high energy, high energy growth, has got significant areas which could be used to grow grasses. China's the same, that's China. Europe is interesting. Um, Europe, uh, Spain, out towards the east, uh, not so much in Central Europe, a little bit in Scandinavia, very little in Britain, very little indeed in Britain. That reflects the density of population that's here. Ireland is in pretty good shape, by the way. Uh, and then uh, in the mid-US. So the mid-US has large areas of land which is currently not in use for anything, really, that could be used, that could be used to grow these, these pesky grasses. The question now comes is where does does that oh sorry I should well this is the total this is so this is the this slide here is where degraded land could be used. This slide then is the next layer of what's called biomass availability, is where is all the green stuff in the world? Right? And you find and red again is good and blue again is bad. Sahara Desert there, nothing grows there. Brazil is just jam-packed full of green stuff. Yeah. Uh, most of Canada is, lots of Russia is, lots of, lots in China and Southeast Asia. Very little notice in, in Australia, apart from around the edges, uh, and quite a bit here um, in the Philippines. And Europe is not so bad. And just a little thing about the UK, when it comes to total biomass kind of availability, Scotland is particularly rich in biomass resources. England isn't so much. Uh, so as a kind of UK policy, Scotland actually is in, in slightly better shape. So back to this. This is the slide I showed you earlier. Where, if you were to take the kind of map of where biomass, and particularly where scrubland availability is, does it map over the areas where the energy needs need to be met? We would say yes and no. So first of all, China. China, I showed you that there was a lot of available land there which could be used for convert, converting fuel costs. Maybe that is one area. India was the other area, wasn't it? And you notice that is that is an area where we expect more than a doubling in energy use. So maybe maybe those two areas of the world could and should and must make better use of their available uh, cultivatable land for this type of this type of this type of crops. Uh, Brazil perhaps is the other way around. It's got lots of areas of of, of biomass, but the, the energy demand increase is perhaps not that significant. The U.S. is the interesting one, and this is now going to drive a socio-economic um, dynamic across the world. 
if the US has projected increase in energy demands as significantly less as a fraction of their total energy demands compared to those developing countries, for good reasons. Right? And yet, the US's access to biomass, and particularly cellulosic biomass, is significant. And it's going to be interesting to see how the US plays this. I've got another slide later which shows you where I think they're headed in terms of them using the technology and being able to develop cellulosic biomass. So I would say that the, the overlap between increasing energy demand and biomass availability is mixed, but the principal areas of India and China probably do uh, have good overlap. So you say, Paul, what's the issue? Grow more grass. Yeah? Grow fields of grass. Yeah? Just let farmers grow grass everywhere, ferment it through, make, make fuel like there's no tomorrow. It's easy. But of course it's not that easy. And this is where the science comes in. And this is the, the bit where you'll see, I think, there's been an advance. So the story starts here. This is a sycamore leaf that was uh, fossilized 40 million years ago. Right? And it was fossilized in something what's called a rapid burial event. So you can imagine those plants out there, say you went back 40 million years, out there, all of a sudden there'd be a landslide or something like that. And it would cover all of those plants there. What that's, what's that mean? It means the following, is the plants would die, yeah, because they've got no more access to oxygen and light and air, but also they'd be cut off from biology, and that's important. So they wouldn't go through the normal degradation process which those plants would, would normally do. And you know that things get degraded, don't you? If you stick them on your compost heap, they degrade. Why have I shown you this? I've shown you this because at 40 million years old, and that's a very, 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 very long time, um, anything that's in there uh, must be incredibly hard to break down. Incredibly hard to break down. And indeed, when you look at this fossil and you analyse it carefully, what do you find in there? Well, you find perfect, <laughs> and I mean perfect, uh, pieces of a plant. In fact, that fuel, that cellulosic bit, has not broken down. It's an extraordinary kind of facet about biology's <coughs> ability to make materials which are almost impossible to break down. And here it is. Here's the issue. The issue is that these things, these grasses, they make cellulose, which is the same material that's in this sycamore leaf, that for us are almost impossible to break down. Biology can do it. But we can't. And what does that mean? It means all the sugar in here is not accessible for fermentation, and it means that we can no longer, we can't release the bioethanol, the fuel from it, as we would like to do. That's the central challenge. That's the central challenge. And actually, it's been for a long time, these types of grasses have been called the holy grail of biofuels, because if we were able to harness their energy content, then potentially we could address some of the problems I mentioned earlier. I should tell you, this is a beetle here. Beetles don't have cellulose in there. Something very close to electrical called chitin. Uh, and that's similarly, uh, similarly difficult to break down. Now, just a little story here, and then you'll see where I'm going. This is a, this is a picture of a US Army hospital at the end of the Second World War, at the end, uh, down in the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. Why, why on earth am I showing you this? Uh, when the U.S. Army was advancing through South, the South Pacific, they were setting up the army hospitals to treat their wounded. The, you know, have you seen the MASH thing on TV? It's the same type of thing. Uh, with these canvas tents. And I should tell you that canvas is grown, is, is grown from, is made out of cotton, and cotton is cellulose. It's the same material that's in the, uh, in the plant here. Uh, all fine, right? You set up these tents, no problem. In the humid and temperate atmosphere of South, the South Pacific, the US Army found out that their tents were getting great big holes in them. And they didn't understand this. Um, um, and what was happening is that the tents were put in this atmosphere, and, and organisms, fungi, were dropping onto them. And the fungi was eating away at the canvas, at the cellulose. Now, stop for a second. What's that mean? It means that the fungus that dropped on there must have somewhere in this biochemical apparatus an ability to break down cellulose. Right? Now, the US Army was worried about this for different reasons because they didn't want holes in their tent, and they employed two people, Elwin Reese and Mary Mandels, to investigate what it was. And I've got Mary Mandels up here twice because 
Now, all, if you look at, look at the history of this, the person who's associated with the discovery of the fungus that breaks these down is, um, is Reese, and it's never Mandels. And, Man and, uh, and Mandels has rather been written out of history, unfortunately. So I'm rewriting it back into history as one of the discoverers of the bits of biology which have equipped themselves to break down the cellulose. And I tell you right now, at that point, this was, a 19, this was 1951, began a race to find out how biology did that job. Why? Because if it, biology could do that job and we could harness it, then we could release the fuel content that's in these grasses. Um, and th these are just some of the, uh, some of the organisms. Uh, all fungi do this. And in fact, you see fungi absolutely everywhere. Most bacteria do it. And some of my colleagues in biology, um, this is Simon Queen Mason and Neil Bruce, look at a little shipworm. This is only Yadig, by the way, actually, I think, that eats peers in Portsmouth and, and Venice. Um, true. And that it, it, it has equipped itself with the enzymes to do this degradation as well. So biology is full of the equipment that we need, that if we could harness through enzymes, to do that degradation to help us do the conversion to fuel. What are those enzymes? A tiny amount of science. Tiny, tiny, tiny. This, this is the, now we're looking at molecules. So this little grey hexagon here is a sugar unit. That's the bit we want. This is it all locked up in the grass down here. If you could see the molecular structure of grass, it would look like this. The enzymes, the enzymes which come along, they're given particular names, to forget about the names, but they stick to the surface and they nibble away molecularly the bits of sugar and they release the bits of sugar. Um, they spill out. Here they go. Out there. And that's how it was thought, by the way, in 2010, that fungi and bacteria broke down these dudes. They, secret they just squirted out these little enzymes onto the surface. And I should just say that uh, you, use, you use these enzymes every day. They're in your washing powders. Because uh, enzyme-containing washing powders uh, have enzymes taken from these organisms to help your, wa help your, uh, help your washing powders be more effective. So how do modern biorefineries use those enzymes? So this is, this is a biorefinery I just got off the web. What happens is the, and you notice this biorefinery is in the middle of, middle of fields. It takes the crops from the fields, they come in here, they're stored up, they're probably pre-processed a little bit, and then, they, then they're taken into here and they throw it in with the enzymes, literally throw it in with the enzymes. The enzymes do their job, chop, 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 release the sugars slowly, and then the sugars are then fermented, and you see the fermentation plants and the stills here through to ethanol. That's the modern biorefinery. Oh, one, one example. Yeah. Where are the bottlenecks in that process? The bottlenecks are getting the feedstock in. Yeah, get the right feedstock in so you make sure you're in the right area. The big bottleneck is the conversion. That is slow. That is slow. It takes several days to, get, to break it down. And then there's the energy cost, of course, the distillation. And in fact, you can break that down. There's been a lot of studies on this about where the economic costs of biorefineries lie. And these are, these are bioethyl biorefineries. So the capital costs break down as follows, right? There's the cost of, uh, there's the cost of pre-treatment, there's the cost of turning, turning that into sugar, there's the cost of the enzymes that you need to do this, there's the cost of the waste, and there's the cost of the plant. You actually need to build this. And you notice that the biggest cost there, the cost of setting this thing up, not surprisingly, uh, but then the cost of tra treating the waste that you put out there, because you don't break down it all, and there's all some left over, and there's the cost of the enzymes and the distillation. Those are principal costs. That's just setting the thing up. What are the running costs? The running costs are here. Um, principally, it's the cost of the plant. And then this bunch of things here, running through from 13 to 16%, are all to do with the breakdown. And you notice that waste treatment is a really important part of the cost. If you can reduce the waste of these things, then you will start to run them into economic viability. And in fact, it brings us to this point. And if you, this, this, this next point is absolutely everywhere. Where are the economic barriers to developing these biorefineries to be able to do this conversion? Well, they boil down to two things. One is the cost of the plant. The cost of the plant becomes critical. And the second thing is known as the enzyme cost barrier. And the enzyme cost barrier goes as follows. It's the, pr one of the second principal bottom, or one of the principal bottlenecks of us being able to take this and convert it through to bioethanol, which is, for all the reasons I mentioned, is critical. The cost of the production of the enzymes, 
and the cost of the action of the enzymes is so high that it makes the economic case not viable. In fact, if you take corn bioethanol, so this is not this stuff, this is corn, it costs about $1 per litre to make bioethanol from corn. Right? That's not corn. Cellulosic bioethanol, which is ethanol from this dude here, costs about twice as much. If you want to be economically sustainable, then we have to get those costs down to 30 cents per litre. You'll notice even so-called first-generation bioethanol needs a government subsidy to get down there. But worse still this, the enzyme costs that you would need to break down this dude here, right? and remember you've got to have a total production cost of 30 cents per litre, are greater than the total cost that you need to go down to. In other words, you're already in debt just for the enzyme proportion of the cost. Put another way, the enzymes are different. So the discovery by Mandels and Rees didn't really factor in how efficient these enzymes would be in our hands. So is it lost? Is it lost? Can we, is it impossible to get efficient enzymes of high enough kind of purity to be able to do that conversion? Maybe, maybe not. Remember I showed you this slide a little bit earlier with this is the, this is the sugars in the grass and these are, these are these enzymes that Reese and Mandel's discovered that chop down, chop down the stuff there, right? Well, in 2010, we discovered a brand new partner to all this, right? And I've, I've depicted them scientifically as green triangles. There they go. And they have to contain little copper ion in there. These enzymes, which are new players on the block of biomass degradation, are called LPMOs, lytic polysaccharide monooxygenases. What do they do? And they've always been there, by the way. They just hadn't been discovered. So they were in the things that destroyed the tents. They were in the things that Mandel and Rees found, but they just, didn't, they just didn't take them out. What do they do? They boost the conversion of this material by these enzymes here by about 100 times, 100 times. And so this piece of biomass degradation now allows us to think very carefully about actually using this as a biofuel source because all of a sudden the enzyme cost barrier goes down by about a hundred times. Now I, I, I couldn't resist putting this. This is an actual picture of the enzyme itself, yes, which we discovered here at York. And I, for the chemist in the audience you'll see this is a beta sheet and other healing quite like this. This is the this is the bit of plant or sugar that sit, the molecular view of it that sits on the enzyme, right? And the enzyme just sticks itself on the on the sugar. Beautiful. Yeah. It recruits some oxygen from the air and a reducing agent for the scientists amongst there. And it does the business here. Can you see the gray, the brown sphere? This is a little copper ion that activates oxygen from the air and snaps open the chains of sugar. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful bit of, of science. Uh, sorry, of, of chemistry. I, of course, I didn't invent the chemistry. I just discovered it. It's a wonderful bit of biochemistry. It shows I should have done biology at the university rather than chemistry. Uh, and actually what the enzyme does is it harnesses the oxidative power of oxygen to break down this fabulously difficult material. Incidentally, if you've got a compost heap at, heap at home, tonight, go there and dig in. Right? Dig into the middle, and you need to get to about, it's about 50 centimetres down. You'll find that if you put newspaper in your compost and you haven't turned it, uh, 50 centimetres down, it'll still be there. Why? Because it's only the outer layers of the compost heap that get the oxygen that this enzyme can use to do the degradation. The things in the middle don't get enough oxygen to complete the degradation. By the way, uh, newspapers are, are cellulose. And that's why you have to keep, turn your compost heap, incidentally, to keep the, oxygen, keep the oxygen in. So these enzymes now change the way we think about biofuel generation. Now, th this plot here uh, is one that was presented by Novozymes. They're the world's largest producer of enzymes, they, they work from Denmark, uh, in biomass conversion efficiency. In other words, how much sugar can they release from substrates? And the key thing is there's a pot of time. And we discovered uh, LPMOs in 2010, right? So notice they've been messing around with their formulation, and they got it up from one to four biomass hydrolysis units. Here's a discovery of these LPMOs. And all of a sudden, the, the efficiency takes off. So. 
the company that sells the enzymes and their ability to convert the stuff that's in here with a standard enzyme mixture uh, increased from 2010 at four biomass units to uh, six, eight, 10, 12 to 12, and I know there's some more on top of that. Uh, in terms of being able to take this through the show. That was the commercial, that's a commercial effect of adding LPMOs to, to these biomass degradation things. This is my favorite plot though. And by the way, at this point, I need you to have in your mind the plot I showed you earlier about where the biomass sources are across the world. In 2014, three years, three and a half years after the discovery of LPMOs, there have been one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine new bioethanol plants opened on the technology. The first one in the world was this one in here, here Crescentino, Italy, that used, used the new enzymes um, to start converting through uh, bio, the grassy, grassy uh, biomass into, into fuel. Um, in 2012, the Italian plant had commercial breakthrough. In other words, was able to generate fuel sustainably. Right, 2012. What are the number? On the back of that, lots of other people decided to make cellulosic bioethanol plants. What are? What's the same plot of plants now, three years later? So these are the biorefineries. And by the way, biorefinery. What's a biorefinery? But when you look at a biorefinery, it can be anything from one football size field to a uh, uh, kind of chemical plant. So it's something like the extent of ten or twenty sizes of. Of, of area, enormous investments, and the world has now started to open up these biofines, which are able to take this material and convert it through to fuel. But there's a worry, isn't there? And you can see the worry. Where are those biorefineries opening? They're opening where the technology is, not where either the need is or even the biomass is. And so you see a lot of, I mean, as you might imagine, you see a lot of the biofineries that open up in the US. There's a lot of biomass here, I should, should be that's slightly unfair. Uh, I, I should say that Brazil's got seven more planned, but they, we don't know where yet. There's a lot in Europe, and you notice Denmark's got three. Why has Denmark got three? I'll tell you why Denmark's got three, because of Carlsberg. Carls, it's true. Carlsberg Brewing Company, many years ago, had too much yeast. They didn't know what to do with it. So they set up a, a foundation, a company called Novo, to investigate how to extract the enzymes from the yeast. On the back of that, they made an enzyme company called Novozymes. Novozymes is now the world's largest commodity enzyme supplier, and they make the only enzymes for, actually with DuPont, beg your pardon, to break down biofuels. So therefore, Denmark has three cellulosic biorefineries because they've got the technology. It's a beautiful plot, by the way, of how technology drives uh, these, types of, these types of breakthroughs. <coughs> None in Africa. Madagascar is about to build one, and I've only, got, I've only just thinking about it, I should say, right? There's not in Australia apart from one down here, what, only one in China, rather interestingly, and only one in Russia. And I'll remind you where the biomass is, it's here, here more likely, here, here, and somewhere up here. It is quite, si and, and a bit down here. It's quite separate from where the bioethanol plants are going up. What an interesting thing. When the demand for fuel is going to go significantly, it's going to, it's, it's going to expand enormously here and here and here, and yet the sources that generate this particular type of fuel are not in those particular places. Why? So I'm going to finish with some pictures. This is a picture of... Um, the cellulosic bioethanol plant in Crescentino, Italy. This was the world's first one that took these types of things. Uh, that's the pattern to the top. Uh, this is the um, this is a piece of a tractor. Uh, this is this is the stuff they put in. These are this. Uh, now there is a difference between straw. This is straw. It's not hay. It's straw. Uh, straw is the stuff that farmers get rid of one way or another. Uh, this now stuff. This stuff is the, they put bales of this stuff in and uh, from grasses. And it's fermented through to bioethanol. This is the company's uh, flyer, the commercial flyer. I quite like this because this is the a picture of the stuff that comes in. Notice they've got two, two lorries coming in. They use 270,000 tons of material per year. And you know this is demeaned by the marketing department because they've got two lorries going in and four lorries going out. That doesn't make sense, of course. Uh, but they generate about just under 80 million litres of bioethanol per year. 
it's a very significant contribution. In fact, if you drive around northern Italy um, and uh, past some petrol stations there, you'll see these green petrol pumps. Um, these green petrol pumps are selling bioethanol from, from the Crescentino plant, which uses LPMOs to do the digestion. I should add at this point that normal cars can take up to about 10% of ethanol straight into the feed. So you can actually spike your fuel up to about 10% and your car will run quite normally on it. 20% it starts to go a bit funny and after, beyond that it doesn't run. But you can adapt your car then to run at higher percentage of ethanol, up to 80 or 90% actually, if you wanted to. Oh, for, you'll forgive this, I'm sorry. Um, for, for this, Gideon Davis and I, who did this work together, we, we won the ICME Global Energy Award in 2016, but that's, that's not my favourite photograph, this is my favourite photograph. This is in Campinas in Brazil last year. This is me standing next to a petrol pump um, at one of the local stations there. The petrol pump that I'm actually holding on to sells LPMO, cellulosic bioethanol, actually from uh, uh, a plant nearby called Heisen, uh, which generates, um, generates bioethanol um, just, just from, actually just from grass. It's an amazing, it's an amazing kind of plant. But this is the last slide. And this is the question I have for you guys. Um, yes, there's technology. Yes, it's working. Yes, you can see it. Is, it. is it environmentally sustainable? I think it probably is. Is it economically sustainable? All the biorefineries tell me it is. Right? The one in Crescentino say they, they now break even. Uh, they, uh, that was last year. The one in Brazil, they told me they were break even last year. Uh, that's, that's economically. Without subsidy, I should have. Um, and that's all fine, and that's all great and may well help us address our biofuel needs. But here's the question. Where's the material? Well, I told you the material is in bits of the world where these plants aren't so much. And where's the need? Well, the need is in areas where these plants also aren't so much, uh, if at all. And these are, this is a picture of, uh, uh, actually, Madagascar. These are subsistence farmers growing corn, I think it is, right here. Uh, uh, then for selling on the terrible land, of course, they, they're growing on. You'll notice that the farming techniques are not the most advanced. Uh, but that, that land there, which is relatively poor land, scrub land, could be used for energy crops uh, very significantly a, and provide a source of income not only for the farmers but the, the local area and help meet some of the energy needs. And I guess you might say, well, you know, Paul, the, the reason there aren't any biorefinery plants there is that if you look at the economic case, the costs are for the capital and you know, the investment in those particular countries, maybe there's not the capacity there to do that. But I would, I'd leave that as a challenge for, for most people, and something, certainly something for uh, people better qualified than me to think about. Because the technology is there, and it's evidence that it works is, all, is also there. And that's it. Thank you very much. Really interesting, and I'm pleased there's only a couple of slides in there with too much heavy science. I think we're all able to really engage with it. Thank you. Um, okay, so we've got some time um, for questions um, and discussion now. So, does anyone like to get us started? The questions at all. Yeah. Just a simple, you know, you said uh, it costs three cents per litre for the enzyme, and that that was most of the cost. I got a bit lost there, around right about slide 20. Yeah. yeah. That's for first generation, I think, Thomas. Yeah, and then he said three cents per litre is almost all the cost. I mean, if it's a dollar per litre, three cents per litre is only three percent. I don't get it. Yeah, that's for first generation production. Yeah, but three cents per litre is almost nothing. Three cents per litre is almost nothing, yes. But that's for first generation, that's for conversion of corn starch. Not the grasses. So, so what's what the cost for the cellulose enzymes? Cellulose enzymes, 35 cents per litre. Oh. And is that the current ones, or is that the previous generation ones? That's the current ones. Okay. So that has come down. Yeah, yeah it's interesting for you, right? It's really complicated. <laughs> it's interesting. I'm learning that. In Africa, Angola, um, and the, uh, there's quite a few countries now with significant violence and all plans. Yeah. And all sorts of interesting things going on. It's a big Bible economy initiative in South Africa. Yeah. It's kind of spreading so there's early signs and you know, it's frustrating to so, I'm um, I had a really interesting experience recently in a place called Jella in the southwest of Sicily. 
Sicily. Sicily, yeah. And I was invited there because um, there's a town there which nobody really knows because people go to other parts of Sicily. This is an old industrial town, population about the same as York. Um, and the city's just decaying before your eyes because a little petrochemical plant has been virtually mothballed. We talked about the size of plants. This, this plant was bigger than the town. I mean, you're yeah. talking about yeah. you know, 200 miles, kilometers of road just within the, the town. And so they lost 7,000 jobs in their town before the whole area was just devastated. So, so ENI, any you know, big yeah. Italian, so they'd, um, they decided to turn um, to a to buy a and um, it was interesting because, you know, they knew, I mean, the, the CEO was very open about it, because that kind of we know this is really short term, because as long as the incentives are there. Yeah. But if you look at what's happening, I mean, in fuels, for example, yeah. the biggest growth for liquid fuel is actually substitution with electricity. Yeah. So yeah. the same as Ben's, all their new models are actually coming through the system now, all electric cars. Yeah. So demand for liquid fuels is very uncertain, but that selling those ethanol as a feedstock, as you and I know, for making more valuable things than fuels is really interesting. So, uh, so thank you, that's really helpful. Uh, I know that uh, it's a very complicated question, not least of which is it's dependent on the oil price at any point, is how viable these things are. Um, what I do know though, and so I don't know the answer to the question, but what do I do know is that particularly my visits to particular bio, bio refineries and the bioethanol plants in Brazil, and those are joint ventures between uh, small ventures, but then big oil companies, Shell is involved. Uh, their plans are to invest seven into seven more plants, plants in, in Brazil, which it must be a multi-billion dollar investment. It must be. Yeah. And the question is why? And when I asked the guy, he says, well, we can see a future for this, despite the oil price. Um, and so, despite the complexities of what feeds into the commercial and uh, economic sustainability, people much more connected with the business than me have made the decision that it's worth, it's worth going for. And it's interesting, I think the, the plants in the US used to receive very significant government subsidies. Um, this is George Bush's initiative to help reduce carbon emissions. The current plan, plants, because they now can do the, the cellulosic biotech plants, because they can do the conversion effectively, I understand no longer receive the subsidies. You know, what I thought was one of the most significant statements was Procter & Gamble, almost exactly a year ago, said, having said they would never touch, this is the world's largest yeah. consumer goods company, having said they would never touch bioethanol yeah. because of controversy, and now they would start using it yeah. with second generation. Now that I thought, yeah. so again, beyond the fuel question, I yeah. think the second generation thing is really, really important. I agree with you. I agree. Thank you. Two questions. One, um, with the farmers, is it not still better for them to grow food and use second generation residual crop as opposed to growing just a fuel crop? Probably is the answer. Probably. I, I, think, I, I think I'm speaking more to the fact that uh, if you look at the farmers who own what I call degraded and abandoned land, maybe they don't even own abandoned one would equate those with the lower CO2 economic classes. And on there, you can't grow the food crops. You can only grow the, the stuff here. And therefore, as a source of income, uh, it opens up for these, you know, the poorest of the poor, something which they would have a, a, a that, And that's my comment. Whether farmers on, on richer soil or arable soil can make that choice, you're almost certainly right. Um, and I wouldn't have comments about their commercial or economic choices. And the second one, does it have to be the free enzyme? Um, is it, does synthetic biology not get to play a role in this one? Does it not work? Is yeah, the trouble is with biology, if you, if you use, just use biology, biology is not interested in making fuel, it's making, interested in making stuff itself. And so it converts the stuff it makes into itself. So you make lots and lots of fungus and lots and lots of bacteria, uh, but which of course is not bioethanol. So using the free enzyme basically decouples the enzyme action away from what it, what do you use it for? So you just you just take take the sugars from the enzyme. If you to uh, engineer some technology, then you can get it to well, scale the rate. Uh, so for LPMOs, nobody's figured that out yet, right. and also for the other cellulases, nobody's figured that out yet. And the bi the biomass, the biological biomass, which accrues as a result of using biology, 
particularly in anaerobic digestion, is a, is a such a large fraction of the total carbon that goes in and comes out or out uh, that um, it's, well, I don't know actually, but it appears that the, the free enzymes are the way to go for fuel generation. I, I can't answer your last question, but I can answer your first question, which was on your title slide, which is about can biofuels ever be sustainable? And the answer is, it depends, yeah. I think. Yeah. And, 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 and that's an honest answer, because all of these things that yeah. we've already talked about here in the discussion, they, they, there's an interplay between everything. Yeah. And as, a, as humankind, we were very lucky to have fought, uh, found ourselves a very energy-dense source of energy that was convenient and portable in things like coal, petrol and diesel, that, that we've been able to survive on, and it's only now we're having to look and devise other sources of energy. And, and, and those energy tools are out there, we don't actually have a full toolbox of energy tools yet. Until we populated our toolbox with some more of these energy tools, if we truly understand and know what they do, like second generation biofuels, we can't actually understand what the best forward path is. Yeah, I, I recognise the complexity of it, and not more so that the complexity will change over time, or actually quite rapidly. Uh, I think I, I think my acid test of the litmus test of this is the fact that people are investing in uh, this now significantly, and some will be taking a punt, right? Just perhaps I am with my title, but nonetheless, let's see let's see what happens. Over. And I would say, you know, the, the time scale here, I'd be surprised by how quickly once the commercial world gets its teeth into something, how quickly goes for it. Mm. Ten years. Let's see where we are in ten years' time. But timing is everything. BP got its fingers slightly burnt when it waded into the alternative energy market about. 15, 16 years ago. Before LPMOs. It was, most. <laughs> it was a little bit too early, quite frankly. Yeah, it was a little bit too early. Yeah. And a lot of the cellulosic bioethanol plants in the Midwest were mothballed after yeah. they couldn't get it to work. But now they're building them again. Starting again. Yeah. Um, what, what impact is there on the, the soil? I know you mentioned it's lower irrigation and it doesn't need high nitrogen inputs and so on. But in terms of um, trace nutrients and things, how many rotations can you run the crop on? Yeah, I deplete the soil. I can't answer your question. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't have the figures and the numbers to hand. Uh, what I do know, though, 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 is that uh, once you take all these factors into account, you arrive back at miscanthus as the energy crop, which has, and this is the best I can do for you, the the, the, the minimal impact on all the factors that you that you mentioned there. Of course, balanced against it, its benefits. Whether that ultimately is sustainable, and I'll use that word, I, 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 don't, I don't know. Is it a bit inclined, if you're throwing a lot of focus onto one particular crop type, what, uh, is Miscanthus giganteus quite a broad genetic, genetically, or is it quite prone to then be susceptible to disease and things like that, yeah, planting I, it in huge? Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question, and I don't know to answer that. And moreover, I've not heard anyone speak about that particular question that you've raised about the, uh, the bio-vulnerability, I've invented a word there, of, of single crop supply. What I would add to that is when, I've, when I was in Brazil, they don't use miscanthus. They use uh, a genetically modified form of miscanthus, and they call it energy cane. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, not miscanthus, of a different cropping pond. Energy cane, and they've gone for that. And so... There is some genetic variability in the, in the species that are used. Whether they'll be vulnerable or not, I, we'll, wait, we'll wait and see. Yeah, or whether it can be grown in a, a mixed crop system or agroforestry yeah. setup or something. That, that, so that, the answer to that question, I think, is known about the degree of um, arable, uh, whether this is farmable in, in, in sensibly. Yeah. And for miscanthus, my understanding is that it is. Miscanthus, in the UK, certainly, and this part of the world, and to grow miscanthus as a single monocrop, eventually. Uh, Gigantheus is, is by far the most productive. There are other varieties of miscanthus that grow in the UK, but and not really as a mixed crop, because they go to such different heights, it actually becomes difficult to harvest. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, from a kind of more development perspective, following on from what you just said to the gentleman over there, um, so the Let's your last picture the the farmers in where was it Madagascar or wherever yeah, it was. Madagascar, yeah. um, so it's not like they're giving up land that they would otherwise use for food production. But if big companies like the big oil companies come in, 
then the question is what kind of contract do they offer to the people? Yeah. And, and we've seen that with palm oil production, yeah. for example, where people have to buy seedlings or whatever, and then there is a, you know, um, a drought or a flood or whatever, and they lose all of their investment, and yeah. they end up in debt and they get the debt yeah. cycle. I, I think it's a great question. It's one that's way above my pay grade. Um, and it's, it, it's worth a, a small observation here about what's happened in Brazil with these plants that have gone up and around to set up these, these great fields of, of energy cane production. And what I understand there is that the, let's call them the villages mm -hmm. and the farmers there, the, the, the money that's gone into that, that, those folks have significantly improved their lot, both in terms of education and life will stop. But you can see in that uh, all sorts of caveats and vulnerabilities, particularly for those folks who may be not informed about what the impact of the, of the technology is. And I think it's a wider question for you guys. And one, actually, I'm going to say this. If, you know, if there was a research project that bubbled up out of York, surely this is a great one to do, is to couple together the science with the social science about how mm -hmm. we measure the, and evaluate the impact to best inform the location and operation of any new biorefineries which are springing up like, like there's no tomorrow. You know, a vision of mine would be, there would be a report, University of York, on how to set up a biorefinement. You'd read through it and, and you would address some of these socioeconomic problems that surely accrue to the development of biorefinement. I mean, that's partly why I'm here, is really to lay that challenge to you guys about how one best prevents the technology distorting inappropriately the social fabric, or appropriate issues. Who's funding the buyer of findings that have them? Yeah, so the capital investment, and that's the big one to solve, is a lot of the oil companies are doing this. Uh, and I guess they see this as diversification of their energy portfolio and insulating themselves somewhat to the, uh, the, 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 the smaller fraction of oil use as a total energy demand. Um, so you'll find, if you look carefully, that these biorefineries are minority shareholders, usually not the majority one, will be someone like Shell or BP. DuPont is a big investor as well. I don't know why, other than they make the enzymes. They'll make the enzymes. Well, uh, <clears throat> this might be out of your area of focus, but do, do you notice any difference between um, the private oil companies like Shell and, and the, the more uh, nationally owned ones like in Brazil, it's Petrobras and, and um, a lot of Asian companies have uh, yeah. countries have national oil companies, uh, of course, in China and, yeah. and other countries. And, uh, do they have different kind of ways of acting around this? And, you, know. you, you can look it up on the web. But my impression of just running back through my memory of this is it's the private oil companies that have made the biggest investments, especially in Brazil. Thomas, do you know what the energy conversion efficiency is? Um, from the calorific content of from, the... Well, if, if I think the sun gives me so many kilowatt hours per year, and how many kilowatt hours do I get out? Yeah, I don't know. Because I thought it was only like 2 or 3%. And if you think photovoltaics can give you 20%. Yeah, yeah. So then I ask myself, why didn't I stick a photovoltaic power plant there rather than growing crops? Because you have to make fuel. I thought I made that clear. Well, but there's, you can... Okay, but if we just right, okay, take that point. Yes. But, <laughs> but if I just think about the raw energy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I have no argument with that, and I, that was on my third, fourth slide. Is that you can you can help meet significantly some of your renewable energy demands through the technologies that you're mentioning. Yes. But they don't generate fuel, liquid fuel, carbon-based liquid fuel. And if they don't do that, then there's a there's a because we're such a heavy base carbon economy, fine, plane driving on cars, yeah. motorbikes, yeah. Uh, one has to find a way of addressing that particular demand. And at the moment, the generation of liquid fuel is, is largely vested with technologies like this. It is not electricity generation. Of course, you could take electricity and do some fancy chemistry with it, but then the conversion efficiencies of the piece. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think another factor against the photovoltaics is often the, the metals required. Um, yeah, so a lot of these um, these technologies require you know different materials that are also going scarce, you know, so and they can be you know they need to be maintained and serviced. So to actually make enough total voltage to provide enough energy from the world. I don't know what they can't be done, but it's, that's definitely a difficulty. Whereas making liquid biofuels is 
you know, once the, the fungus grows. It's I think that point can be argued. I mean, yeah. silicon is one of the most abundant materials, and that's the core material in most solar cells. I agree there's other things in there. Yeah, but the metal. Yeah, lots of metals are there. Yeah. I, would, I wonder if there's more comment on the social and economic impacts of these things. I'm intrigued, I'm intrigued socially if, it, if it's mainly for the, the land that's the most degraded, yeah. whether it gives an end point that's perfectly fine and, and satisfactory to lead the land to get that degraded in the first place because you've got something you can do with it and whether that is a correct thing to provide a solution. Um, and maybe it doesn't directly encourage people towards degrading their land, but if you know there's something you can do with very degraded land, does yeah. it discourage people from not doing so? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, let me put it another way around. The, the land that's on here is currently not used productively in any sense. Uh, and so from a, a resource utilisation point of view, one might say that addressing this question, albeit through the lens of second generation bioethanol, is one that we carry with it ben benefits, simply because it's utilising what resource that we have. In this case, it's land. Whether there are knock-on consequences of that which we've not seen, I, I don't know. But it, it, it seems to me, instinctively, that it's a question worth, worth addressing. I'm particularly intrigued about the ability of the technology to drive social change, and hence my willingness and enthusiasm to speak to you guys, actually. The previous guy mentioned the thing about, you know, back 15, 16 years ago, uh, was it Shaw that said, uh, invested into into these sort of biofuels and got burnt. What do you think the likelihood of that happening is now, considering there are way more plants springing up, so if anything goes wrong, it's going to be way worse, in terms of investments? Sure. sure. Um, do I feel much sympathy to those people that might get their, might get their fingers burst? No. Uh, do I, do, I, do I worry that if this fails a second time, that it knocks it on the head forever? Yes. I guess the experiment is in, is in progress, isn't it? We'll wait and see. I'll, I'll go back to again what I, what I found. This is anecdotal, and whether it extrapolates across the piece, I don't know. But the willingness to invest from the people I speak to who make these things right is significant. I presume that they have done at least the mathematics, if not the guesswork, to get to the point where they think there's a future. Well, we definitely know the oil's running out, so. Uh, that is one motivator that seems to. question. Okay, well, um, um, well, in a minute I'd like to thank Paul um, again for, for the talk and thank you all for um, the discussion and the questions. Um, I think we still have tea and coffee and, and biscuits at the end and I think we still have the room for another 10-15 um, minutes so if anybody wanted to stay around I'm sure we can convince Paul to stay and have a cup of tea and maybe um, discuss a little bit more if anybody has got further questions that they'd like to discuss. Um, but otherwise I'd just like to thank Paul for a very interesting talk. Thank you very much.